Sounds good. Okay. So, and you can hear me okay? Good. Okay. So um, I've been going to Burning Man, um, I think 13 or 14 times. Um, the first time I went, I think was 2008, 2009. Uh, Burning Man takes place, for those of you who don't know, in the Nevada desert, actually on Paiute, um, uh, what used to be Paiute territory. Um, there still is a reservation nearby and uh, it's a big playa um, and it belongs to uh, the BLM right now. So it's controlled by the BLM. And uh, this, we, uh, we rent it, if you wanna say, as an organization for six weeks out of every year, uh, starting in late July through the first week of uh, September or so. And then the event itself, the official part of the event is a week long and happens over the uh, Labor Day weekend. And so Burning Man is, um, uh, the brainchild of uh, uh, Larry Harvey here, who you see in this picture. Um, and he was an entrepreneur in the San Francisco area. And he started it back in uh, San Francisco in 1986. And after being repeatedly told that they couldn't burn things on the beach, he eventually found a better location to, um, to, do, to have his activities. Um, the event was pretty small until about 1998. Um, and then somewhere around there, it went over the 10,000, and now it's uh, restricted to 75,000 by the BLM. And uh, Larry Harvey, very, very early on, um, came up with these principles. Um, and I don't know exactly what year, but I would, I would guess it's somewhere around 1988 or 1990. Um, and uh, they're his principles that he kind of imposed on the event, and the event has held to them and continues to hold to those principles. And I think there's a lot to learn from those uh, principles. Obviously, you know, it's a utopian environment. It's, you know, it lasts for only, uh, you know, a short period of time and, you know, everybody can do anything for a short period of time. But I still think there's a lot of things to, to come home from it. Let's see. So Burning Man for a lot of people is the event. And for some people, it's their entire life. I would say for the majority of people who go there, who are open to it, um, they are completely blown away by it and it alters their life in some manner. They take something home with it that they live with the rest of their life, whether they go there one time or whether they go there multiple, multiple times. And for a lot of people, it's a healing place. So if people who have had either physical or psychological trauma or, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're LGBTQT and they don't, They've never really met other people from, uh, you know, from si who have similar personalities and similar likings. And so they take that away from them. And so for many people have a very, very special attachment to this event because of that. So the 10 principles are such uh, radical inclusion, gifting economy, decommodification, radical self-reliance, radical self-expression, communal effort, civic responsibility, leaving no trace, participation, and immediacy. And these are things that we can apply to every day of our own lives. And by the way, all the pictures with one or two exceptions are all ones that uh, I have taken over the years. So radical inclusion, uh, Burning Man's open to everyone. There's no prerequisites, obviously, like a lot of other things, um, it's dominated by white North Americans, but about 25% of the people who come there come from other countries. And uh, we're starting to see a lot more um, people of color and so forth attending the event. Um, we, the Burning Man organization itself actually now invites the local Paiute tribe to come free and spend a day there. So all, any of the citizens can now take a bus to Burning Man and actually spend the day there. Um, you know, since we are, kind of in their territory and everything. Um, this is Slim, you see here in the center here. He's getting the Rookie of the Year Award from our camp. And Slim is in his mid seventies and is a rancher from Southern Eugene area. And I don't actually know his real name, but he apparently manages a, a couple thousand acres of grass fed organic cows. And he was invited by one of our other members and um, he was a, he was, he's classic of somebody who just never thought they'd be a burner type and, and came there and was just blown away by it. And uh, we were so thankful to have him at our camp. And these are a lot of my other camp mates. 
Jose here is meeting a mantis, a praying mantis for the first time, although it was dead. Uh, Santiago, you see down here in the corner, he named himself after the, uh, the trail in uh, Spain, which he's been on a number of times. Um, but these are all some of the different camp members we have. They're from all over the United States and from a number of foreign countries. All my different campmates. And as you can see, they're quite a diverse group. A group. Our oldest campmate is 80 years old and our youngest is usually around 18. Second is a gifting economy. So at Burning Man, you are not allowed to buy or sell anything. You buy a ticket to the event, you have to buy a ticket for your car as well, which discourages people from, uh, encourages carpooling and discourages people from having a lot of vehicles. Uh, but once you're at the event itself, the only thing you can buy is from the organization itself, and that is ice and coffee. Um, and those two items, all of the proceeds for go to the local uh, uh, Paiute tribe and to the high school in Gerlach, which is the small community nearby. Um, so the Burning Man makes no profit off of those itself. And everyone is expected to bring a gift. And sometimes that's a physical gift. Like you see here, this guy's from Spain and he has set up a croque madame and a croque uh, monsieur um, gift in front of the temple um, that he set up one morning and you could come there and have breakfast uh, for free. And he served probably, I would guess over the course of uh, a couple of hours, five or 600 people uh, with this uh, meal. Um, and you never know when these people are going to pop up. And I go out to the playa every morning thinking I'll have breakfast somewhere, but I don't know what it'll be or where it'll be or who's going to be serving me. And so this is my favorite coffee place, but I only occasionally am actually finding it because the playa is quite big. It's five square miles and you're walking or on a bike. And so you may not see your favorite place because all of these vehicles like this one see here are on wheels. And so where it chooses to be on any given day is very variable. And when the food is out for that day, it's gone. So it's very ephemeral. This is my husband giving his gifts. He gives these little pendants, glass pendants that he makes. And he makes a couple of hundred of them every year. And he gives them out to all of the cool people he meets. And he gives them out to everybody on our camp. And these are some of the different types. These pendant giving is very, very common here. And some people give the gift of, this is a event center that somebody has set up and you can come and have your lunch with your friends there. You bring your own food and they've got the event center all set up. And then this is one of my favorite, Talk to God. Um, this is a phone booth that's set up and you can pick it up and nearly always there's somebody on the other line and you can talk to them. And so, and you can tell them whatever you want. And it's usually counselor type people that tend to do this, but uh, it's pretty fun. And you don't see them because they're in another phone booth um, about a quarter of a mile away. So you're just talking to, to God at that point. This is another, this is a bar that's open for about two hours every afternoon. And um, uh, they love it if you donate booze to their bar. Um, but they, you know, it's all free. You go there with your friends. We were having a, a little social there and we had a great time. This gal here with the backpack, with the vacuum cleaner on it, she has a, a vacuum cleaner in there, a battery in there and hair scissors. And she will cut and trim your hair and vacuum up the bits so that they don't get up on the playa at the same time. This guy here is a local professor from o OHSU and down in the corner here. And uh, he has a portable sound machine and he'll come and play music for you wherever you're at. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of gifts that some people are doing. And then people bring the gift of art. This is the artist with one of his dragon sculptures. This is a, a sound and relaxation uh, set up out in the desert. Um, people serve pizza, um, hot dogs, things like that. You just have to wander around and, and that's how you can uh, find your food uh, as you're uh, having a good time in the day. The third principle is decommodification. They really encourage you not to have any mention of any type of commercial things. They really like it, even if you have commercial names on your vehicles or on your RVs and things like that, that you change it as you've seen here with some of these. Some people go, as you see, quite elaborate, cover their entire RV with, um, you know, with a facade. 
And then any of the large commercial art, like these two sculptures you see here, you never know who actually is behind that. It's never anywhere on the sculpture that this was sponsored by, you know, 3M or, you know, something like that. So there's uh, no commodification. All of these large sculptures here, they have big money donors because it takes big money to do them. Some of them are using GoFundMe and other you know, crowdsourcing things now, but you never know who the sponsors are. It's never out on the thing. It's never, um, you know, and even things like, you know, passing out business cards or talking about your business is really uh, discouraged at the event. And then we have these big music uh, cars, which you may have heard about. Uh, these large music cars, um, again, here, these are two of them. These are two of the most popular. This is uh, Mayan Warrior here wow. on the right and Robo uh, Heart on the, uh, the left here. And these are unbelievable uh -huh. sound systems and they bring in very well-known DJs. But again, you never know when the DJ is gonna be playing and where these vehicles are going to be. And you have to, you have to kind of, talk to people and ask and listen and use your senses. Even that, even only recently did we have cell phone uh, signal out there and, and when the main event is going, this, there's not enough cell phone signal to handle everybody. So a lot of it is still, you know, literally word of mouth, walking around, seeing things, talking word of mouth kind of things. And then radical self-reliance. Um, means a couple of different things to different people. To me, it means that you bring everything to the event that you need. But to a lot of people, it really means you, you talk to people and you work with people and you express your needs to other people to get what, what you need. And this is a really good example. This is um, a friend of one of our campmates. And he actually came to our camp and he says, I want to do, do a DMT trip. He's a, he was a suicide. He'd been very suicidal. He says, I want to do a DMT trip, which is um, a psychogenic drug. And he says, I want to do it in the manner of MASH, you know, the uh, painless on, on MASH of the suicide is, uh, I can't even remember what that was called, suicide is whatever, and everything. And so we did this whole ceremony around him and we had minders for him while he did the whole thing. And, um, and we got him all decorated up and we put him in his white suit and everything. We didn't have a casket. So we, you know, we, we had the next best thing. We gave him a nice little pillow thing and everything. And he had his trip well supported with lots of minders and everything had a lovely time. And uh, he's done extremely well since then. It was, uh, it was a really pleasure. But you know, he asked for all of these things that he really wanted. He put this experience together and we were all willing and helpful to do that. And this is another example, this uh, art, uh, uh, thing was way, way out on the playa, way away from a lot of the buildings and everything out in the, and I had really enjoyed it because it had birds and I really like birds and everything. So I had been out visiting it a couple of times and get doing my photography and stuff like that. And I'm out there one afternoon and uh, something called, um, one of these big dust storms comes up. I'm trying to, uh, hubbubs, ha haboobs um, came up. And, and these dust storms are wicked. They're, they're 50 to 100 mile an hour winds and it kicks up everything and you can't see anything. And of course you need to come prepared at any time for a dust storm. So you always need to have goggles and masks are very popular even long before COVID there. Everybody has a mask, carries it with them, you know, and everything. And this uh, storm came up and you literally could not see a thing. And I was there and I was pretty familiar with the sculpture. So I knew there was this huge box which was covering the generator for the sculpture. And so I went there to hide there and grab these two girls and we went and both hide, hid there. And this couple you see sitting there on the bench, the husband had been to Burning Man a bunch of times, but the wife, this was a first time exp uh, experience for her. And she was just terrified and just absolutely screaming. And so we sat there across from them and uh, they refused to come and sit by the box because a few minutes after we got to the box, the box, the whole box just flew up and rolled over us. And this is not a little box. It was like an eight by four foot plywood box just rolled right over the top of us. And we sat there and talked to her the whole time. And she just sat absolutely stiff on that bench and didn't move. And we kept telling her, you got to not move. You're going to run into something. Somebody's going to hit you. Just got to sit there. She's absolutely terrified and everything. And, uh, and after that, she was walking away saying, uh, you got to take me home. You're taking me home now. We are going home now. I'm not doing this again. But but as you can see, everybody else had a really good time and just enjoyed getting covered in dust and smiling about it. And, and you know, there's resilience there. Um, but part of being prepared, that means having your mask, your goggles, 
bringing everything you need. I bought what we call a, a burner vehicle, which was my this tent for this uh, pop up tent for 50 bucks. And uh, um, it leaked, but it didn't matter out in the desert. And, uh, you know, made an altar on one side and a nice sleeping area on the other side. Uh, when I go to Burning Man, I originally I never slept with my husband there because um, it's too hard to have a really good experience and be with your husband at the same time because they're having their own experience and it's just really too hard to coordinate all of that. But so we both brought our own uh, stuff and our own arrangements and everything. But you know, everybody has to have a bike. Everybody has to have a tent or someplace to sleep. You can't just sleep out in the open, especially with the dust storms. And it's very, very cold at night and it's very hot during the day. And um, there are a dozen of places around there that repair bikes uh, all for free. And they're a lot of fun. And that's just part of all for all of the experience. And then this is probably what Burning Man is mostly known for is this radical self-expression. And that relates to the art you create, the art vehicle you might bring to the playa, um, how you wanna dress. For a lot of people, it's their first chance to try on an alter ego. Um, you know, maybe they've wanted to be a cowboy all of their life, or maybe they've wanted to, you know, walk around in a tutu or a dress or, you know, something they've not had a chance to do. Um, and here it's just completely accepted. However, and if you just want to walk around naked, you can do that too. Uh, nudity is totally tolerated. Um, sexual expression uh, in the public eye is not uh, tolerated, but... Um, but these mute, they call these mutant vehicles. They're, um, they all have to be approved by uh, Burning Man and you're not allowed to drive more than five miles an hour on the playa. Otherwise you can't drive on the playa. But you'll see these just, they're just amazing things to be walking around the playa and have these vehicles go by you. Um, there's, just, there's just a profundity to them in the bareness of the desert to have these vehicles. And a lot of them have this Mad Max theme uh, to them, as you can see. And you can see the, people, the owners put a lot of work into these, these vehicles. There's a Volkswagen uh, camp who has about a dozen of these very large Volkswagen vehicles. This one over here is just a Toyota Highlander with cardboard on it, but he's done an amazing job on it. And then a lot of the vehicles have propane. Propane's kind of popular out there. Everybody wants propane flamethrowers and torches and lights and LED lights and things like that. And some of them get very creative, like this moving house here and a moving boat, moving ducks, moving animals. This octopus, um, whose name is in Spanish, I, be, I believe it's El Grupo is what it is. Uh, he's, he moves all eight of his limbs and things like that. Um, they're really pretty amazing sculptures. And they all have a day appearance and a night appearance because we bring the LED lights out at night. And as you can see, you have to have a light on your bike or you'll get hit by somebody because they can't see you. So everybody has to have lights on their bikes and they decorate them with LED lights. Um, and, um, and then all of the vehicles are decorated with LED lights. And, you know, and then the, the vehicles themselves may interact with each other. You know, these two farm vehicles, they were frequently um, in kind of tandem with each other. The scorpion and the praying mantis vehicles, you know, they like to hang out together. It was always a good photo op and people really uh, enjoy that. And then some of the bigger sculptures are really profound uh, to see. This is, um, this sculpture was called the inner child and it shows a couple, you know, that are having a fight, but they're, you know, their inner parts still want to communicate with each other. And it just leads to a lot of ability to really, when you walk around the playa and think about, um, you know, what the artist is trying to tell you and, and what they have to say. And here you can see that sculpture at night. It's always amazing how these sculptures look different during the day and, and at night. And all of the sculptures are really intended to be interactive, whether it's, you have to have a little bit of physical ability to get up on this slab of rock or up on top of these metal sculptures, or like this tree of life over here, which changed colors every 20 to 30 seconds. They're having a live play here. They had a, some, a theater group that was doing a live play, interacting with the audience and the cars coming by. And then they would move from that sculpture to another sculpture and start the whole process all over again. And then down here on the lower left, this guy has a, a harp 
And these strings are 300 to 500 feet long and extend from this harp up to the temple. And then at night he would play these uh, strings and they were just amazingly deep uh, sounds that kind of resonated over the whole playa. And just more of the really fabulous, uh, these are some of my favorites, the chicken ranch and the um, this uh, fire truck. They're just um, amazing sculptures and amazing things. And just notice the, the bicycles and the people around them and you get an appreciation as to how big the, these uh, vehicles really are. And just more beautiful art that you can just walk around. This particular vehicle with the scissor lift is pretty cool. That scissor lift goes up about 50 feet and it's all lit up in LED lights at night. The creativity of people is just amazing. And uh, just interesting, you walk around and, you know, this creature comes by, um, you know, and looks at you. This guy would never engage with anybody. He would just look at you. And then, as I said, at night, all of these vehicles change their appearance at night. And then there are these big sound systems. Um, all of the sound systems are way out on in, in the deeper playa, so it's not so noisy and everything. They bring in very famous uh, DJs who play at really interesting hours. So again, you're often left, you know, wandering around the playa to try and figure out when you get to see the persons that you really want to, the, the DJ you really want to see. So number six is communal effort. So we are part of a camp that ranges from 75 to 125 people, depending on the year. And, um, you know, we all participate together. A lot of other camps are this large as well. Um, and, you know, it's all about building the camp, coming there a few days early, putting the camp together, and then maintaining the camp during the week. Um, I was always the morning sous chef because I didn't mind getting up in early in the morning. So I'm getting a kiss there from the, the regular chef because she, she always appreciates that I would have everything done in the morning and then she would take over all the shifts in the afternoon and evening. But just, it's all about working together, doing things for each other, doing events, sharing things, contributing. Everybody has something to contribute within the, the group. And all of the camps do this whether it's their willingness to take pictures of your genitals and provide them back to you or wash your body for you, um, which is very interesting consent system around that. Um, the Barbie death camp is kind of a spoof on uh, Nazis using Barbie dolls, but it has a real serious aspect to it. It really makes you think. Um, these are all things, as you just walk around, every camp has some theme um, and something special about it. And then they express that as part of the camp. Civic responsibilities. There are a lot of things you can uh, do at Burning, Burning Man to support the entire event. One would be the lamp lighters. Since there's no electricity there, um, all of the light is done with these little um, oil lamps at night um, that isn't done by LEDs and, and things like that. Um, and they're all they're put up. This is Maid Marion. She's one of the chief financial officers for Burning Man, has been there for years. Um, and um, we, uh, Burning Man has some, an interesting relationship for both their medical and their law enforcement. Um, all of their initial medical, you're expected at your each camp to be able to provide some level of medical, even if it's using a ground beef for an ice pack. And this is one of our ER physicians from uh, Australia who is assisting one of our um, campers who had a fall. But um, they have these little units and you can work as medics in these units. You can't do anything more than suturing up a laceration really, but you can work in these medics in this unit. And then if there's anything more serious that needs to go, and these little units are all over the, the playa in very designated locations. And they're also radio connected. So that's where you go if you, ha if you have help or you need help. Um, and then um, it's, um, as Dr. Eliason pointed out earlier, uh, Reno ER used to offer, uh, provide all of the medical services, the actual real true medical services, although that's provided now by uh, CrowdRx. And then we have a similar relationship with uh, law enforcement. BLM is the primary law enforcement on the, and then Washu County Sheriff is, and they patrol the facility. They're pretty good natured most of the time, but the burners have their own rangers as well. And those rangers really act as a go-between between, between the official law enforcement and the burners. And they're often there to really diffuse situations. You know, if there's somebody who's going crazy on drugs or did something inappropriate in public or something like that, 
the law enforcement will often let the uh, rangers deal with uh, those uh, situations. And they often use those rangers to diffuse situations you know, that otherwise would have escalated. Um, and so it's really a very, very, and the, I'll tell you what, the BLM guys that come out, they're always, they're just a lot of fun to hang out with. They're just, they're just uh, really great guys. And they always consider it a privilege to be um, assigned to um, Burning Man. They have about 200 law enforcement uh, people that uh, handle it. The, the event is surrounded by this fence, as you see here, it's called the trash fence. And there's always BLM right out on the outside of it to keep people from going into the rest of the, the playa. We have this policy of leave no trace, which is one of my favorite policies. And people literally leave no trace. Even human hair and feathers off of your things and pieces of wood are considered what they call MOOC, which is matter out of place. And you'll see toward the end of the event, you'll see all these people walking around, or actually they're not walking around, they're scooting around on the ground, picking up these little pieces. And you can see here in 2015 from this map, all the green places were all the places where the after cleanup crew found essentially no nothing left on those campgrounds nothing um and uh if you are in a camp that is red as you see some of these camps here you will not be invited back you will not be allowed to have a camp again in the future and sometimes there are accidents as you can see here our shower leaked and we literally had to scoop up all of that mud uh, that got there and put it in these blue containers and haul it out with us. Uh, we rake the ground when we're done to look for any little bits of matter. Um, we dehydrate most of our water using this little homemade dehydrator here. Anything that has fuel has to be contained, things like that. It's all pack it all in and pack it all out. And then participation, all of the art there and all of the activities and all of the camps are really about participating, allowing other people to participate in whatever your activities are. So this tilted church here had these big speakers and you could go inside and play on the uh, piano and it would play it out to the, uh, the local playa just beautifully. Uh, some of the activities are a little bit more dangerous than others, um, and sometimes they get shut down because they're a little bit too dangerous, but most of the time it's, you know, play at your own risk. This uh, operations thing shocked you if you uh, touched the little thing on the side here. I wasn't very good at it, actually. And then people find interesting ways to uh, add, people will add books to an exhibit like this. They'll add, this peanut was not originally part of this piece of art and somebody apparently had it and added it in. And then this is, this is, um, uh, I can't remember actually what they're called, but it turns and then the figures look like they're moving in motion. And, um, but you have to get about four people together to pull on these ropes to get it going. So you actually have to recruit other people. This is a rosary here with all the stations of the cross. And then you stand on here and then you connected the two electrodes together and music would come on and um, the, the, the different areas of the, the stations of the cross would light up and the rosary beads would have a running light on them. So they're all just very interactive. This is one of the more dangerous things. This thing turned around, spun around, and uh, people would get hit pretty regularly by thinking. And as you can see, it was sharp edges and a little bit difficult to climb on, but you know, everything's worth a challenge. And just, you know, we have a clothing closet and uh, I had to laugh because we found some clothes in this closet that matched my uh, trailer uh, pattern beautifully. And so we dressed up and of course had to do a little photo shoot and everything, all of these moments. Weddings, there are a lot of weddings out there. I get asked to photograph a lot of weddings. People love having weddings out there, very much are spontaneous in the moment at times. And then we have these big events. This is um, a chanting, uh, monkey chanting here. And we have, we create these human, human pyramids. There's a group called Death Guild, which has this Mad Max style fighting instead of, inside of a dome. Sometimes you get hurt like this guy did. Um, everybody brings their instrument and you have this impromptu band going on, marching band. And then the last thing, and I think this is something we don't do enough in our lives is immediacy. Um, you know, you might die tomorrow, so you might as well do it you know, today when you had the opportunity. This is um, us setting up camp here and Robo 
heart came by and they stopped at our camp and we started dancing and they stayed for a whole hour while we danced and it was just a whole lot of fun. And just amazing what can happen sometimes. We had to burn part of our floor because it was no longer functional. It had been in use for more than 15 years. And so we got permission to throw our pallets on the leftover temple burn. So this is at like two or three in the morning and the whole camp woke up and we said, okay, we're going out and doing this. And we hauled it all out there and we threw it on there and we danced and we cheered and we enjoyed each other's company. And it's just, you know, it's just moments that you can never, uh, you know, it was very spontaneous. We, not, we had not planned this at midnight and by 3 a.m. we were all out there doing this. And uh, it just becomes very, very special when you do that. You, know, you take the time to do that. We all knew we were going to break camp the next day and it was going to be a lot of work, but you can just tell by looking at the faces how much this meant to everybody. So, and this was a very special event. This, uh, this uh, almost 30 foot tall made out of bamboo and LED lighting by these two gentlemen who are both as Spurgian as all get out. Um, had created this and brought this to Burning Man and everything. And, uh, and I had met them and talked to them about it and helped them with a couple of things. And then I'd also met the, the people who did this, did these marionettes. These marionettes are 30 feet tall from Spain. And they're quite impressive. You can see all the ropes that makes them manipulate them and everything. And I started to talk to the photographer and everything. And he's like, oh, you know, we're doing a documentary with these. He says, we would love it if this other Burning Man, this uh, LED one would come and visit our gal here and they dance together. And so I made the arrangements and we got it over and, and now it's part of their documentary the, a document. I, I couldn't get the video to, to, to load. So I didn't, I'm not gonna do, show you the video but we brought those two together. And these two, this is like the event of their lives. They've never, you know, they, they both are bicycle mechanics, um, do e-bikes and stuff like that. But for to have this extremely well-known Spanish man, um, uh, artist, you know, um, agree to dance with their mannequin in um, a video with, uh, now in the documentary, you know, it was just it's just a life-altering uh, event for them. It's just so exciting. And this is another example of that. This friend of mine here. This is her hen party because she's getting married the next day. And one of my other friends ran into this guy out on the playa here, the one with the goggles and the little G-string and said, hey, would you lap dance for one of our friends? And so we got a really nice boudoir art car out and we took it out there and then we picked him up and she got her lap dance from him as part of the, the um, uh, hen party. So on Saturday, after you've been there a week, the man burns. Um, and it's just, this is a spectacular, joyous thing where we have lots of fireworks and lots of fire dancers and there's big explosions and, uh, and then we burn them. And then the next day, about half of the crowd goes home, but the other half stays uh, for the temple. And the temple is something that started in 2020 and it was started by David Best, who's, who's uh, quoted here. Um, because one of his friends had died and he built a temple in honor, just a little tiny temple in honor of his friend. And people took over that temple to express their grief and also some joys in their life. And after that, they decided to make the temple an annual thing. And so now they have a contest every year and people design the temple. And the temple is made out of scrap wood. Uh, oftentimes it's CNC cut and it all has to be burnable. And then the amazing thing is they build this temple and then what people do is they fill it with stuff and they fill it with, you know, remembrances, people who have died, things that have happened to them. They put their journals in it and people spend just days looking at everything that's in here. They write on all of the wood. The wood is designed so that you can write on it. Um, and they pray in there and they have ceremonies in there and it's very solemn and there are temple guardians. These are people who volunteer to make sure that everybody behaves in a very respectful manner. And the art cars all turn off their music when they come around the temple and everything. And people to bear their soul in this temple. And it's so good and so healing for so many people to see other people have gone through what they have gone through and also to share what they have gone through with other people. 
Um, and it's just, it's just an amazing uh, thing to see. And it brings you to tears every time you walk through it. And uh, it's very solemn and people are just unbelievably respectful. Um, and it's just absolutely beautiful. And then we burn it at six o'clock on Sunday evening and everybody sits there and it's quiet. And for the first time, the whole playa is quiet and there's no music going and there's nothing. And all you hear is the crackling of this and the temple going up. Um, and that's the end of the event. And it's just such a sad, but yet remarkable thing that happens every single year at the very end. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nicole. This is a, a, a fascinating uh, a, a description of an event that uh, many of us have heard about, not many of us have experienced. And I, I want to remind all the members that are here, we're always looking for stories of things that healthcare providers do that are different, uh, whether it's a event that you attend or a hobby you have. Uh, we're always looking for that in chart notes. And also we, we like to highlight and often bring members in to speak at our events that are local and have a local interest. So thank you very much, Nicole. You're welcome. Thank you, Nicole. This I'll see if I can figure out how to stop sharing now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Nicole. This is one of the things that I think is fantastic. It's a very fun thing. It's very informative. It's way out of the range of most of us. And, uh, and so it's, it's great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So we're going to segue our, our to the business portion of our meeting, which um, thankfully will be very quick because we have some some friends in the in the deck waiting to come and talk. Um, we discussed how much business we wanted to to bring up here. We wanted to talk about some upcoming events, financial information. We would encourage you to contact a board member myself or Keith, if you have an interest in seeing the finances, we're not gonna put them up. I'm not gonna bore you with spreadsheets today. Harvey, do you have the events? Well, at this time you're going to be handing the gavel to Oh, okay. So I'm anxiously I'm, waiting for it. Well, I'm, I'm anxiously waiting too. It is my honor and privilege after serving uh, uh, as president for the last two years to pass over the presidency to Keith Neiman. Um, he has been a, a member of the board. He's been a committed uh, community member. And I know that the society will be in great hands with Keith on board. In, in the words of, of, of the children in each one of us, Keith, Tag, you're it. Yeah, no one said this was two years. Are you serious? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, uh, you know, I don't really have much to say because I really want to hear from uh, Dr. Pierce and Dr. Harder. Um, I think in the last couple of years, we've really been focusing on self-reliance and really working on individualized self-care. And I think that that has been an important aspect, particularly during this whole pandemic. Um, I would say that one, one thing I would love to see from the society is a little bit more of a transition towards focusing on um, community connection. I think that that's something that amongst us as physicians, as we have kind of segregated into our private practices and out of the hospital, I, I don't see the same camaraderie that, you know, we maybe would have experienced, say, 15 years ago. And, and I hope that some of the events we do and these organizations that we can start to come together and just, you know, while focusing on self-care, actually having that partly segue into really becoming each other's friends or acquaintances, not just in a medical community, but also we all have a lot in common based on the fact that we work as physicians and, and you know, care providers are really focusing on getting to know each other more than just what we see at the hospital. So that would be my goal for this society and really inviting more people to come. I'd love to see you know, 100 and 200 people versus say 30 or 40 and we'll get there, we'll, we'll work on it. So. Um, with that being said, I think, um, Harvey, do you mind if I just uh, turn the time over to Dr. Pierce? Is that okay? Yes, please do. Great. Dr. Pierce, hello. I'd hello. like to turn over the time to you to kind of give us a little bit of a, kind of a little talk a little bit. So, sure. so thanks for having me on. Uh, so it's kind of cool. You know, I joined the Medical Society in 1994. 
And to all of you who are medical society members, be careful because you don't know where the path will lead. Um, I was a uh, board member, then medical uh, society president, and then uh, continued in medical politics to the OMA board, uh, and then uh, became the president of the OMA. And uh, a lot of it was advocacy on the part of uh, physicians and uh, patients at the state legislature and at the uh, federal legislature. And you uh, go and do meetings and things. And then lo and behold, when Governor Kitsap resigned in uh, 2015, I got in my head that I should run for governor. I have really, there wasn't much more planning than that. And no Republican wanted to run. So it was a fascinating run. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get, you, you get, you, you get the idea of uh, running for political office and potentially serving and it seems that this is the right time to make that second and final run and uh, having a great time of it. In terms of our participation in uh, politics, you know, we physicians are perfect for the time that we find ourselves in. Um, by temperament, we're great. You know, I think things are way too noisy and loud and uh, destructive and angry. And we're trained to control those emotions and, and bring the temperature down in the room a lot. Uh, we're trained to uh, be rational, analyze data, and be problem solvers. You know, we got lots of people who can talk like crazy, but very few who can seemingly accomplish much uh, in political leadership. And we're really the opposite of that. And uh, so again, we're, we're perfect. If you haven't noticed, healthcare is probably 18% of GDP, <clears throat> running at over $4 trillion. And it's a system that begs for reform. I mean, when, when we have a, a state that has 4.2 million residents and where our hospital care system is broken by 1,200 patients, basically, you know, we have one bed per, per, per thousand patients, we have a lot of work to do. I mean, we have a tremendous amount of work to do. So again, we, we should run. We. So I'm running, Kathleen's running, we have a city councilor. Um, we doctors should go ahead and do it. I advise you to get your toes wet in medical politics. Uh, if you haven't done re uh, real politics, it's a great segue. And again, society needs us to lead. Society needs you to lead. We need our skill set much more than our you know, political uh, beliefs or affiliation. So I'd encourage you to lead. When I, when I was involved heavily with the medical society before I ran off to do this kind of politics, we struggled with the same idea of getting people to come to meetings. I recommend make them great, interesting, low cost, and you might get doctors to come. Uh, we rallied around a foundation, which was uh, very useful in helping society before the Affordable Care Act and getting free uh, medical care and medical advocacy on the, on the part of physicians, other providers, non-physician providers, uh, and on behalf of our patients. So go at it be involved. Uh, if I am unsuccessful in one of these next two elections, you might see me back a lot more with our medical society. And thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Pierce. I appreciate it. You're thanks. You. And you've been on the board for like, you know, a long time before, right, right after I transitioned on, I think you were transitioning off. And yeah. um, so we appreciate your service on the board too. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Dr. Harder. Hello. Do you mind give us a few minutes of your time? I think you're still muted. There you go. All right, sorry about yeah. that. Hi everybody and thanks for having me, appreciate it. Uh, I'm so glad I could finally get a chance to talk with you guys. I've been stuck in the hospital all day, it's been uh, crazy. So um, for those that don't know me, I'm Kathleen Harder. I'm an internal medicine hospitalist with Salem Clinic. I'm also a wife, a mom, a grandma. Um, I'm on the Oregon Medical Board and I see one of my fellow board members there in the room, um, immediate past president of the medical board. And now I'm candidate for the new Oregon Congressional District 6 seat. So um, I, my task tonight, I was asked to, and actually Bud spoke to this quite well, but I'll, I'll add a few additional comments. I was asked to spend a few minutes on the topic of why should doctors and healthcare professionals get involved in politics? And you know, I, I can think of a few reasons. Um, and trust me, I've been thinking a lot about this over these last several months. You know, perhaps it's about exercising our voice. You know, doctors don't vote. We vote less than lawyers, farmers, and the general population. Often less than a third of us who are registered to vote actually cast a ballot. We also donate to candidates much less than other professions, remarkably less. Maybe it's about representation. Out of 435 House of Representative uh, 
congressional uh, leaders, only 13 are physicians, and only one of those is female. And there are only four physicians in the Senate. Perhaps it's about the fact that healthcare accounts for nearly 18% of the GDP, as Bud mentioned, yet the people who are making healthcare policy decisions have never seen a patient or been trained in real science. Perhaps it's the fact that healthcare touches nearly every other political issue. We really need to push for health in all policies, individual and family health, community health, economic health, and leaving a healthier planet to our kids and grandkids. But I think the real reason that everyone should get involved is this. In a time that has arguably, arguably never been as divisive as it is right now, maybe since the Civil War, the people who are best equipped to heal our country are those that heal as a profession. You know, every time we knock on an exam room door or a hospital room, we know very little about the person on the other side of that door. We may only know their name and date of birth. We don't know about their values, their belief system, their wealth, their poverty, their triumphs or their tragedies. What we do know is they need our help. And within a very few short minutes, we have to build a level of trust with them to the point that they are literally willing to put their lives in our hands to get them healthier, less broken, and more able to face the days ahead. So I'll share a quick story. You know, I went to uh, med school in Dallas, Texas at UT Southwestern where Parkland Hospital is. And I did a lot of ER rotations. And when I was there, the trauma bay one and trauma bay two had not changed at all since JFK's assassination. And there were some trauma surgeons who were still on staff there when I was in training who uh, spoke to me about that experience that they were actually on site when uh, JFK was brought in. He was brought into trauma room one and uh, standing there was a very eerie, very um, place to be. And at the time it, it had literally not changed one little bit. What was really interesting to me in listening to their stories about those days is a few days later in trauma two, his assassin was brought in. And those surgeons took the same care for those two men. It didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter what they had done. That's the sort of thing that we are trained to do. We are trained to be empathetic. We are trained to be science driven. We're trained to take the best care we can for the people that are in front of us regardless. So the reason physicians should get in politics is really quite simple. Our families, our communities, our state and our country need us. They need us to help them get past this monumental challenge that these last two years have been and to build the collective resiliency to be up to the great challenges still ahead. In this profession that we have chosen, we have so much to offer in this place and time. And we all have a choice to make. We could stay in the background and pine for the good old days, the way things used to be, or we can be a catalyst towards a better future. To me, the choice is really simple. Step up to the challenge. Let's start the healing process. That's what I believe, and that's why I'm running for Congress. Uh, obviously, Bud's uh, been down this road. Now, this is his second time of doing this. And, you know, you learn a lot every day in this process. You learn a lot about yourself, a lot about other people. Um, it, it's an amazing ride. So I encourage you all to, uh, to dip a toe in the water and get involved. In the meantime, support Bud and support me because we need your support. And uh, uh, we're, we're both here and happy to answer any questions you might have. I know time's getting light, but if there are any burning questions, we're happy, happy to answer them. No pun intended, right? Burning questions. <laughs> uh, Dr. Harder, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, well, do we want to say, Harvey, do you want to say questions for the end real quick and then, you know, talk, turn the time over to Doug to introduce the President's Award real quick or? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Sure. Okay. You can stay on at the end if you have further questions for Dr. Pierce or Dr. Harder. Sure. So, yeah, Dr. Lyson, take it away. Well, thank you. I, I get to do one more duty as, as I exit the, the position of president, and that is um, give a award that I think, quite frankly, is way overdue to this individual for the things that she has done for the community. Our awardee for the president's award this year is Aaron Hurley. Aaron is a pediatrician who came to our community and has been here about, I believe, about 20 years, Aaron started out with Kaiser Permanente, and then found her first passion. Her passion was for families in crisis. 
and she became involved with Liberty House and spent years helping families through some of the worst experiences of their life, helping I identify and, and get treatment for individuals that needed treatment because of traumatic events that have occurred in their life and helping facilitate a process that is a scary process to all of us. Well, that wasn't enough for Dr. Hurley because she also in the last couple of years started developing a real passion for kind of what our theme is, which is about wellness. She recognized and started a journey that was both personal and also professional to try to find ways to, to take us to a better place in a world where we are under stresses that sometimes uh, with issues that we don't control and it impacts us and it impacts the care we give. So in the end, it has to be addressed and she didn't choose to just talk about it. She chose to actually do something about it. So it's my honor to give the President's Award to Dr. Erin Hurley for her work in support of wellness and her work in support of families in crisis. Erin? Well, thank you so much, Doug. And I just want to say that um, I've, it's just been an honor to be part of the Medical Society. There's so many amazing things that this organization has done. Um, you know, it's over 150 years old and it's still standing and still supporting and changing to try to help support clinicians. And so um, one of the things I found is that I was struggling 20 years in my career and I found some things that helped my wellness. And I just felt like I can't keep this a secret. There's other people struggling just like I was struggling. And so um, we've talked about that as an organization and the organization has been very helpful in supporting some of the different uh, wellness activities. Dr. Hotan's uh, done some of those. I've uh, done some of them as well. Um, and really putting a focus on that sustainability. You know, I think is we're not robots, we're not machines, we're humans. And we have feelings and families and other things going on in addition to patient care. And so just really uh, striving to make an impact on individuals and then also on how we, um, how our medical culture is and how it treats us. And so um, again, I just wanna say thank you to the Medical Society. It's such an honor to receive this. And also thank you for your support of the wellness activities that I've done. And I am going through transition, working, working less in medicine and working more in wellness. And so my hope is there'll be lots more offerings for the community um, in the coming months. And then I would just say that, you know, I really uh, desire to help other people who are struggling and it's been really tough and um, in all areas. And so if you have a need, you can find my information and chart notes, look me up, give the Medical Society a call. I'm more than happy to provide um, support if you're struggling. So thank you very much. Congratulations. Um, all right, I think I'll turn the time over back to Harvey. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, that pretty much winds down our meeting. I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Uh, awesome. Love the Burning Man thing. And what a great transition to politics after that. Uh, was just great. Everyone was great for being here. I want to let, let you know that the Medical Society is planning some things this year. We're assuming all this COVID stuff's going to wind down. We can actually get together at some point in the future. And, uh, you know, cross your fingers, right, Dr. Hurt? We're looking at a um, spring member meeting on May 26th. We're looking for a venue for that. We'll be discussing at a board meeting. We have dancing date night in July and new, new provider celebration sometime in the fall in our holiday event in December. And uh, we're also gonna be putting out a survey to all of our members on fun things that we might be doing for throughout the year. So look for the survey and vote on things that you'd like to do. We have golf day, snow day, volunteer day, craft day, all kinds of fun ideas. So check that out and look for that. So congratulations again, uh, Dr. Neiman for being president this year. Looking forward to an awesome year. And thanks for taking the realm on that. And with that, uh, if anyone wants to hang out and chat a little longer, feel free to do that. I'll just leave the thing on for a while. I'll probably turn off the recording and we'll go from there. So once again, thanks for being here and we'll see you soon.